Well, good morning, Cornerstone. All right. Well, I'm excited this morning. We always say there's a lot going on here, but there really is always a lot going on here. And uh, th this is exciting times. We're going to take a break from our current series, A Journey with Jesus, studying through the book of John. Uh, in, in light of many of the things that are coming right down the pike here, uh, I want to make sure that we align ourselves together. And uh, we're, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 6 this morning. And I, I believe that, uh, that God is a story maker. He's a storyteller. As we look at the Bible, uh, we see how he's preserved his story. Uh, and, and I have, uh, as a pastor and a student of the Bible, I have fallen in love with the Old Testament, looking at the stories as God has preserved them. And I'm uh, going to take you there this morning just to examine how God revealed his plan, his vision, his journey to the Israelites through his servant Moses, and, and draw some parallels uh, where we're at today, the, the New Testament tells us that the things in the Old Testament were written for our instruction to encourage us, to give us endurance, and we're going to look back there today, and uh, I'm, I'm fully excited about how God is, is pulling all of this together, and I want to talk about our story and how the two fit together. So let's take a moment and pray, and then we'll get into God's Word. Father, I thank you for what you're doing here at Cornerstone Church, what you continue to do week after week. God, it's our delight to continue to keep our eyes fixed on you, to follow after you, to submit ourselves to you. And as a church family, we, we are united going one direction. Just so grateful for how you're moving and working in our midst. God, I pray that as we go through all the busyness of ministry and projects and expansions, uh, again, just trying to keep up with all that you're doing, Keep our eyes focused on what's really important. Father, you've commissioned us to be effective as a church at making disciples. There was a high price paid for that. So, Father, I pray that as we go through this, we wouldn't take our eye off the ball. Bless us in the area of genuine life transformation to develop passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we would continue to submit ourselves to the authority of your word. Help us to have a high view of the Bible. As it has come from your very breath, there is great wisdom and instruction. Father, help us to be a people who submit to that. And I know that you'll bless us as we do. Father, I also pray that you would make us effective at being a shining light as we reach the lost I'm blown away Sunday after Sunday, Father. You just bring people here. There are salvations. Even this morning, Father, the movement of salvation as the gospel is proclaimed. I thank you for your spirit being active here. Would you continue that, Father? Help us to remain a gospel-centered church. And above all, Father, help us to be that church that continues to exalt Christ above all other things. He is our King. He is our Savior. He is the reason that we are doing all of this. We are following him. Thank you that he died on the cross for our sins so that we could have abundant life, life with a purpose, with meaning. And we're excited to partake in all of this as a church family. Keep us healthy, Lord. Continue to do your work here. We are your servants, and we will follow you. Thank you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me talk a little bit about our story here at Cornerstone. Uh, we're going to pay attention to the story as God writes it in Deuteronomy chapter 6 of the uh, Israelites going towards the promised land. But at the same time, I, I think it's important to review. You've heard me tell it before. You're going to hear me tell it again and over and over again because this is something special here. Our story is to be celebrated. And the story of Cornerstone Church began before I became the pastor. It began before people started forming together. It began when God decided he was going to rise up a church here in Clarion County, and this is what it was going to look like. And this has been the piecing together of God's plan since the very beginning. Now, in 2012, Cornerstone was established as a church. There was a group of people praying, trying to figure out what it was that God was trying to do, trying to get 
uh, under his will, follow him. And it became a prayer group that met over a series of weeks. And from that, a church was birthed. Now, that's a very strange way for a church plant to start. Without a pastor, without a building, just a congregation, just a small group of people praying uh, to the Lord about what's going to happen. During that time, as they advanced into the next year, it was the last week in January when this building, Traditions, was purchased as the church property. And it was the very next week, February 3rd, that I came here and was uh, brought on as pastor. By the end of that year, as you heard Barry talking about in 2013, the debt on this building was paid off. One year. It was amazing uh, to see how that all came together. And, and then we moved on to 2014, and the Lord was blessing this church, and it was growing so rapidly we could not contain the people in the building. So we built an annex for classrooms. We ended up having to go to double services because we couldn't fit the people. So then we used the annex for two services, and now it's filled as well. And the service period, uh, the service times today, again, filled with people. And here we are again in, in 2016. Not only are we getting prepared to pay off the debt on the building projects that we have done, but again, we're looking to do another fix to try to allow for more growth. And it's another Band-Aid. It doesn't fix the problem. That's why we're keeping our eyes fixed on the larger project, trying to get into a building that is sufficient to house this growing church. But it has become quite a journey. Last week, we had over 400 people here just on a regular attending Sunday service. God continues to bless this place. And it's an exciting time to be here. Now, as I look around, I see faces that some of you were here a few years ago, some of you have just come in, some of you have been saved here, some of you have experienced life change and freedom. Every person that I'm looking around, you are playing a part in this story. I wish we had time just to, just to go around and talk about this a little bit, but it's important for you to think. Whether you're just coming on board, whether you've been here since the beginning, this is our story, this is our journey that God is bringing us on. And it is very meaningful to me how, how I, I fit into here, and I want you to think about how God called you here. I was down in Virginia. I had a ministry down there. Uh, it was an adventurous ministry. We learned a lot, my wife and I. She's coughing over there. And it, it, we were way out in the woods, but it was wild. I mean, God took us way out in the wilderness, and we had 10 people for our first church. And God blessed it, and we ended up having... Uh, we grew it to about 80 on, on an average Sunday, and, and it was a very exciting time, and uh, I loved those people because it wasn't just transfer growth. Those were 70 people that we led to the Lord, so I, I felt a personal responsibility to invest in their lives and to disciple them, and, and to such a degree, we worked so hard that after seven years, I took a sabbatical because I needed to work and invest in our marriage. It had taken a toll. Uh, there was just uh, abusive times that were going into the church, and it was hard on our family. So we called a timeout and said, we're going to just focus on our marriage and get healthy as a family. During that time, I had been mentored by Randy Spencer, who was a uh, pastor up in this area at one time, and Mandy has family up in this area. So we came up here visiting Mandy's family during that time of rest, and I said, well, I want to find this place called Cornerstone because uh, my mentor had talked about some of the people that were involved in that. And I just wanted to check them out and maybe meet some of the people. And we came here to the, corner, uh, the Cornerstone Church. It was at a university room or a hotel room. It was, it was at the university. And uh, in the very first service, Mandy leaned over to me and said, John, I think we're supposed to be here, which I thought was crazy. I was very happy and, and invested in the ministry that I was in, in in Virginia. But it didn't take long. We began to pray through that. And, and I was convinced, too, that it was the Lord's will that I come up to this area. But it, that was a gut-wrenching time for me because I loved the people in Virginia. I did not want to leave. I felt a responsibility there. And I, as I explained to Mandy, the Lord did a work on me, which I called lifting the mantle. I just had this deep burden for these people. And then as God revealed that to, to me and to us that we were to come up here, I just felt that responsibility lifted from me. And I was able to let go. But then the mantle came to this church, and I felt completely called. And I looked at Mandy, and I remember our conversations, Mandy. 
they're not going to hire me as the senior pastor. I was just up there visiting, telling them that I was on a sabbatical working on my marriage. <laughs> That's not a great way to introduce yourself to a church, candidating to be pastor. And I remember, our, but we were so confident, my wife and I were so confident that God was calling us here that I said, look, if they don't take me on as the senior pastor, I'll just get a job up there and we'll come to the church because I know God wants me to be a part of this church. So if it's not as the pastor, I'll figure out what it is part of. But for however it all came together, you guys did call me out to be your pastor. And it was, it, thank you. And that is extremely meaningful to me. That is how Cornerstone became a part of my story. And I wonder how it became part of your story. And it, because God builds his church. I've spoken. I have spoke with every single member of this church, and you have sat down in my office, and you have told me how God called you here. And some of your stories are amazing. Some of them involve pain. Some of them involved faith. Some of you were just saved here. It's been an amazing journey, but I think it's important that you know how you fit into this story. And some of you are just getting here and wondering, God, is it here that you're bringing me to? Uh, we, we're, we're excited about this place in history. So what I want to do today, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I just want to draw some parallels in Deuteronomy chapter 6 about the story that God was uh, unveiling to the Israelites and the story and the journey that we're on today. So number one, as we read the first nine verses of Deuteronomy 6, I, I want to stress to you that the journey ahead cannot be about us. It is not about us. All right, let me, let me begin with these first nine verses and we'll discuss this. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Verse 3 Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children." And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And you shall walk by the way, and you shall lie down. And when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. As God was telling uh, Moses how to speak to the people about their journey ahead, he established to them uh, that this was not going to be about them. It was much larger than them. Now, in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us uh, that when we, become a new, uh, uh, when we become saved, if anyone is in Christ, they become a new creature. The old is gone, the new comes, and, and we're giving a, a new sense of purpose, a, a new reason for being here. So I want you to understand, number one, uh, as this journey is no longer about us, it gives us a, a new purpose. When you come into the uh, to the house of the Lord, when you come into his household, when, when you become a part of his family, uh, we live for God's glory. That's what unites each one of us here. Whether we're having a service here at Cornerstone, whether we're uh, leaving this place and we're at our jobs, we're at school, uh, we're at our homes, uh, in relationship to our uh, spouses, uh, we exist now as followers of Jesus Christ to bring glory to God. We are supposed to glorify God. There's much instruction about that in the New Testament. It's no longer about us. It's, it has everything to do about how we're living uh, for, for the Lord. We see this in, in verse 5, where a very uh, a famous verse here, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. It's no longer the love of self, the love of pleasure, and the love of things of this world. It's, it's about an obsession with a holy God who is in relationship with us. It is no longer about us. Jesus calls this the greatest commandment. And Christians, if we miss the greatest commandment and your life is not all about God, but you're still wrapped up in yourself, just by default, if you're breaking the greatest commandment, you're, you are uh, living out the greatest sin. Uh, to, for a Christian to miss this is the greatest uh, affront to God. 
because he has created us for his glory. He has given us a new purpose. He's also given us a new direction. Uh, We now follow God. Verse 1 in chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord has commanded to teach you that you may do them in the land which you are going to possess it. God gives us a guidebook. This, this is his will revealed for us so that we can now go in his direction rather than the directions that we were going before that were causing chaos and pain, suffering, confusion. He brings to that order, purpose, beauty, life. He gives us a new purpose and a new direction. And beyond that, he gives us a new passion. And in this Uh, passage, the passion is reaching the next generation in the first couple of verses and at the end they talk about passing this on to their son and to their son's son, to their children, to the next generation and the following generations to come. This this new passion in the church, it it, it goes beyond just our sons and daughters but to the next generation, even to the the society that we live in, the, the community that we are in. We bear a light that brings life to darkness. We have a new passion. Reaching the lost should be a primary priority of every church in America and around the world. God gives us all these things because it's no longer about us. It's about the work that God is doing and who God is, falling in love <clears throat> in relationship with him. So this, this story continues in verse 10 through 12. Uh, The journey ahead here is necessary to continue the story. Now, God paints a picture to Moses of, of the continuation. As they continue to follow God, this is what will happen, but they must continue to follow him if the story is to be completed, if it is to carry on. And and the same is true with us. Our journey ahead is necessary if we're going to continue to be the church that we are today. Let me read these verses. Verse 10. And when the Lord, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, not if, but when, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that will dig... that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then, in verse 12, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So God here is describing the promised land. There's all this stuff that had been done for them. They weren't going to have to dig the wells themselves. I mean, they were walking into prime land already prepared for them, much like our journey. We come into our relationship with the Lord that we did not earn, that we did not work for. He's done all the work for us. We simply receive it as a gift given to us, just like the, the land to the Israelites. <laughs> and, and I believe, Cornerstone, as we continue to move ahead, as we look where the Lord is taking us, in the same way, it's when he takes us there, not if he takes us there. I believe that the Lord will take us there. We must continue this story and this journey as we continue to be a light bearer For Jesus Christ. But as we do that, did you listen to the warning that God gives to the people of Israel? That when they get to the promised land, they cannot lose sight of the purposes that God has for them to be a light to the other nations. In the same way, Cornerstone, we must be careful because we've experienced multiple victories here that we celebrate. We've got some big ones coming down the road, but some of the greatest dangers to the church today is complacency that is brought about by contentment. We've reached the goal. We've done what we've been called to do. Now it's time to sit back and enjoy the fruit of our labor. If you're enjoying the fruit of your labor as a Christian, I hope that you are in the presence of God in the life to come. Because if you're doing that now, you retired too early. As long as we are here with breath in our lungs, we are meant to be doing the Lord's work together. All right, there's not a retirement plan that's on this side of life. So as we do that, we need to make sure that we remain to be the church that we are today as God continues to grant us victory after victory. There is no retirement to come as God entrusts us with more uh, resources then we are held to a higher standard of getting his word out, of becoming a light, sharing hope with a lost community and throughout the world. The the battle, it is only preparing us 
for battle. Hosea 13.6 gives us uh, this warning. It's a sad warning coming through the prophet. And, and God is sharing his heart as he looks as, at Israel, who are, is now dwelling in the promised land. And he said, as they have their pasture, they became satisfied. And as they became satisfied, their hearts became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. This is the story of many churches today. They've had their victories. They can talk about the good old days 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, depending on the churches. May that never be cornerstone. Our good old days are still in front of us and must remain in front of us. We must continue to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Now, I hesitate to even go here, but I... I recognized, even in my last ministry, the danger that comes when God grants you great victory. We had gone from a church that was hopeless, pretty much sure that the doors were going to close at 10, and then we grew to 20, which I always bragged to them, we've doubled the size of the church, and we would celebrate, and then we grew to 30 and 40, and got ourselves to 80, had a couple great Sundays, we were 130, 150, and we were growing like that, and I remember being pulled into a, a private meeting of the church leadership, and I knew we were headed for trouble when they said, Pastor, enough is enough. <laughs> We've taken all the growth we can handle. It's time for another church to go out there and do their job, and we need, we need time to just stop from this. They were overwhelmed by, by the growth, and I knew we were, we were in, in deep trouble at that moment, though we were able to course correct I gave them the option then. That was, that was probably about year five or six for me. And I, I told them, is, if that's the direction we go, then I need to go because I can't, I can't, I can't come alongside a, a complacent church and just retire and just stop. We have to, we have to continue to grow. So they agreed to that. Uh, but it, it's, it's the danger every church faces. After we win and sacrifice and fight and gain a major, major victory, a major battle, uh, the temptation is to sit back, relax, and rest. And that day of rest is coming, but it's, it's not for us now. There's much work to be done. There is so much we need to do as the church in this culture and in this country. So let me read to you verses 13 through 15, which talks about the journey ahead uh, will require participation from everyone and focus. It will require focus. Beginning in verse 13, it is the Lord your God, you shall fear him, you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. In other words, you will trust in him. All right, so there, he's calling upon these people to fear him, to serve him, and to place their trust in him as they continue this journey forward. And Cornerstone, that's great advice for us. We must fear the Lord that one day we will stand before uh, in answer to, we must serve him together, all of us, and place our trust in him in this journey of faith. It's a sad statistic in many churches that 80% of the people, I'm sorry, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And that's because people aren't fully engaged. They haven't bought into what the church, they're just kind of riding on the coattails of others. We can't do that here. We must fear God, serve him, each one of us, and place our trust in him as we continue along this faith journey. Verse 14, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God in the midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from the face of the earth. In other words, as we follow God, we must avoid worldly distractions. Our loyalty to God, our priority of God in our lives must be relentless, church, if we are going to accomplish the things that he has called us to do. In fact, I would say as we're looking at these things, at the warnings that God gives us that we must avoid these worldly distractions, Satan has two strategies that I think rise above the rest in their effectiveness. And the first effect of the, the, the first strategy is Satan tries to make us bad. And, and this is what I mean. He tries to find that niche in our armor. He tries to find that weakness in our spiritual life that will distract us from what God is doing that requires our faith and attention. And, and it distracts us. And we could go through a whole myriad of sins here. Okay? And some of them are public, some of them are private. 
All right, we could talk about pornography and how that has invaded the church. You cannot be walking a life of faith and right relationship with God when we're running to the computer and, and looking at things that we know dishonor him. We can't be in right fellowship and relationship with him as we do that. You know, so some things are private, and we can get away with those. As some things are public, and, and those people are often shamed. Uh, but what we got to understand, it, unless that we can stand before the Lord blameless, which we can do because of the cross, we can bring our sin to God and say, I'm done, forgive me, cleanse me, and he will, and we leave it at the cross, and we can keep our eyes fixed on Christ, filled with faith, and walk the journey that he has for us. If we can do that, we will see incredible victories in our lives. Now, I would say at an average church, I don't, I don't know where we're at, Cornerstone, but let's say 50% of you are stuck there. 50% of you right now, could, if, if you were just before the Lord alone, you'd say, you know what, that's where I'm struggling. I, I could be doing a lot better in my walk of faith if I didn't have this issue where Satan was, was winning the war with me. So that's probably one place that, that we need to focus on. We need to get our eyes fixed on Christ. We need to lose the baggage. With the gospel comes the power to overcome the power of sin. Not just the penalty of sin, but true freedom and abundant life. We need to get there, people. But there are also a good number of you here who are good people. You can't put your finger on a sin right now that is overwhelming you and dragging you down and just rubbing your nose in the dirt so that you can't follow Christ. However, Satan has a second strategy for you. Busyness. If he can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. He will just get so much activity in your life that the things of the kingdom of God are, are snuffed out. There's no attention. There's no priority there. There's no energy left for that. There's no time left for that. Good people doing good things, but too distracted to be of good kingdom value to the Lord. We need to make sure, people, that we are keeping our priority and our focus and our energy uh, zoned in and honed in on God alone. We, we need to allow God to have that proper place and the proper time and the proper space in our lives so that we can have an impact to be used by God to advance his kingdom. Avoid worldly distractions. Uh, let me read in verse 20 through 24 that the journey ahead will have long-term long ramifications. Listen, verse 20, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we are Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. Verse 23. And he brought us out from there. And he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. As we continue on this journey ahead, if, if we achieve victory, if we continue to follow the Lord, there are long-term ramifications. This carries on not only to us, but to the next generation, to our children, our grandchildren. It becomes part of our spiritual story, our spiritual heritage. I remember the time that we faced this obstacle and God withdrew it. I remember the time we came up against the impossible and God overcame it. It's part of why I today follow the Lord with the fierceness that I do. And we tell that to our children and you can too. It's not just stories from the Bible. It's part of our personal story. There are long-term ramifications to our victory as, in faith as we follow Christ. It, just like church, there are long-term ramifications if we fail. My generation is really stumbling because it was raised by a generation of people who who went to church and, and, and talked the talk but did not walk the walk. I was surrounded by that. But I can't blame the, the behavior of my generation on another generation. We will answer for our own actions. But I will say that my generation is doing an even worse job of the generation coming up 
of, of telling them the importance of having faith in Christ and committing our lives and serving him in the local church and making the church a priority and God a priority in our lives. It's snowballing. There are long-term ramifications to spiritual victories and spiritual failures. Let's make sure ours is a place of spiritual victory. That what we pass on to our children and grandchildren will be something authentic that we not only talked about, but that we lived out. Real faith demonstrated in front of them. And we will raise up real Christians, not kids that fall away as soon as they go to high school, or I'm sorry, as soon as they go to college. And I can tell you that marks part of who we are here, Cornerstone. Uh, we, we take very, very seriously how our, our youth and our children are being educated and are being experienced to the journey in faith and are being brought together. Uh, and, and that's going to shape our future too. We, we do want to be a church that is very strong in that area. But how we behave as a church, how we walk, how we place our faith in God or don't, these have long-term ramifications to those who are watching us and following us. And, and God speaks that truth to, to Israel. Finally, in the last verse, verse 25, the journey ahead will require faith to complete. Verse 25, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Now any time in the Old Testament that you hear that God counts righteousness to his people, it's because his people put faith in him. You can hear that demonstrated all through Hebrews and the New Testament. Abraham uh, had faith in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. These people, it will be as they follow God, it will be counted to righteousness for them because it will take faith in God to win the battle, to continue in the journey. And it will take faith on our end as well, Cornerstone. God is beginning to give us things that are beyond the reach of what we can just do together as a church body. It is beginning to require faith and prayer. Gene Smith isn't in this, uh, the, the second service. He's over in a Sunday school class. But since the beginning, I remember him saying and continue to hear him say, Cornerstone, pray big. God has big things in store. Pray big. Let our prayers honor God. It's going to take faith where we're headed from this place. So let me talk to you about some of the goals that we have in front of us that I believe are a part of this journey. Number one, our special giving Sunday is going to be November 20th. We do this every year. It's the year before Thanksgiving. And as we thank God for the many ways and the deep ways that he has blessed us, we give back to him in a special offering. This year, I am praying and invite you to pray with me. We're praying for $58,000 on that day. 20 of which, 20,000 you heard Barry uh, describe to us before, will we'll cancel out all of our debt. We'll be a debt-free church. The other $38,000 will bring our building fund up to $125,000 to start the next year off. Now, that's praying big. That's a pretty good Sunday for us. That would take buy-in from everybody. But that's what we want to do. We want to make a, a faith statement to the Lord. You know, every service, I always give opportunity for those who are lost and, and feel it is time for them to come into a right relationship with God. I invite them to make a faith statement, to acknowledge their need of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I'll tell them before myself and God, you make that statement by raising your hand. We had five people do that this morning. It's been a good start to our Sunday so far. We do that every Sunday. And this time, the, the statement is a little bit different. It's not just for lost people. It's for the family of God as we're looking at the vision coming down this uh, journey that we're in and saying, Lord, we're there, we're with you, and we're going to make a faith statement as a body. And, 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 and we're going to do that with our combined giving. And I'm praying that we reach that $58,000. I want you to, to pray with me that we would be able to do that. The second phase of our faith journey is beyond that $125,000. We're going to need an additional $375,000 raised to make that significant down payment that would keep us healthy financially as a church. Now, there's some growth that needs to happen between now and then. Growth in attendance, growth in our tithes and offerings, we're monitoring all of that. That's why we're making some more space in here just to get us to where we need to go, but we're close, church. 
And, and where we need to be right now is we need to embrace the direction that God is taking us. All of us, we all have to participate. So I, I have, a, I have a, a couple applications here, and, and I want you to join me with this, especially over the next few weeks as we're praying where God is, is bringing us in this journey. The first one is for uh, the Cornerstone family directly. If you belong to the Cornerstone family, I, I want you to begin to pray over the next few weeks, God, how would you have me to respond? Pray with your families. Pray with your spouses. Talk over it. Mandy and I have already began to talk about, Lord, what would you have us to give? How do we play a part in this journey? Use us, Lord. Second challenge is there are some in this church, as we continue to grow, who are kind of just on the fringes, on the outside. And, and I want to invite you, now is a great time to make a commitment to this church family as your home. If, if you've been just kind of watching and monitoring, praying through God, is this where you would have me? I, I'd like to, I would like to encourage you. On the edge of your worship folders, there's this little tear-off. If, if, if you would pray through that and feel that God is bringing you here, as he has brought so many others here, I, I want you to pray about making this your church home, about taking ownership and making this your story too. All you need to do is put your name on there, a little information, and check the membership box. You can give that to uh, myself or an usher, back to Michelle Adams out at the ministry center in the atrium. Uh, but I want you to pray about becoming a part of this story too because it's going to take all of us. And, and this is a great place to grow, to bring your family, uh, and to walk this journey of faith. And, and finally, I want to make the challenge that if you're just watching this faith journey from the outside, I mean, you've heard about Jesus, you know the Bible stories, but you've never embraced the faith for yourself. I want to challenge you. Today is a great day to take that step of faith and come into the family of God. The gospel is so simple. Jesus Christ died and bore the price of your sin on the cross so that you would not have to be separated from God for eternity. He made a way to make the relationship between you and God right by paying the price of your sin. Now, you can know all that information, but the Bible tells us that until we call out in the name of the Lord, until we ask God to save us and to forgive us of our sins, until we cry out to Jesus, this doesn't become your faith journey. It might be your parents' journey, your family's journey, your church's journey, but it needs to be your journey as well. I want to invite you this morning. You need, if you need to make this your journey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this story. In my ministry in, uh, in, in Virginia, we had a church of farmers. All of them were farmers. Except one man that came in, and he was a businessman. And he was a good businessman. And he came in, and we were also at the point then of launching and taking a faith journey. And as I challenged the church to answer and step up to that faith journey, that man pulled me aside after the service, and he scolded me. And he said, you are foolish to think that this group of people can do what you're talking about doing. But he stayed, and he watched, and we did it. And he got saved. And he's now a pastor down there. He saw the hand of God at work do the things that people like you and I just can't do. But God takes us on faith journeys that accomplish things that are far beyond ourselves. And when we do it in the method and the manner that God has called us to do it as the local church, I tell you what, family, buckle up. It's going to be an incredible journey. But God's the one with the keys. He accelerates when he's ready. He slows down if he feels we need to. But he's the one that our faith must be in. So to each one of you here, you each have something to pray about this morning. Cornerstone family, let's pray about this together. It, the, the idea of getting into a new building is not just so that we would have a prettier building. It is so that we can continue to scale up our part in this spiritual battle that is taking place in our community and around the world. It only puts more resources in our hands that we will be held accountable before God. It helps us to be effective and efficient 
in what God is calling us to do. For those of you who may be kind of on the outside but have been praying through, maybe this is where we'll come as a family, I want to encourage you. Would you just pray through about, about becoming a member here? Make this your story. It's a great time to do this. We want to invite you to be a part of what's happening here, officially taking that ownership. And finally, for those who have been just watching the faith journey completely from the outside, maybe this morning is that time that you make this your faith journey. It begins at the cross. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood on the cross. Have you done that? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sin? Have you looked at the cross and seen the damage that your sin has caused, but the love of God that reaches far beyond to give you purpose and meaning, a reason for living? I want to invite you to that this morning. Church, I'm out of time. Let's go before the Lord and see how he would speak to each of our hearts this morning. Father, thank you for Cornerstone. Thank you for this family. Thank you for those who have been here just a short time or maybe our first-time visitors this morning. But God, I am absolutely convinced you are building your church here and you are doing something great. And you are calling us now to our next step in our commitment, in our faith. Father, help us to stand firm, to rise up and to be your people. Unite us in mind and heart as we follow after you. I'm excited when I think about where you're leading us. But it's not about a building. It's about impact for your kingdom. It's about continuing to see souls be reached for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about having the space to grow and disciple, making passionate followers of Jesus Christ. It's about continuing to surrender in obedience to your word. And again, above all, it's about making as much of Jesus Christ as we can with our lives, Father. That is our goal and purpose. May we exalt Jesus Christ well. As you're praying, church, and your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed, let me just speak to some of my friends in here this morning who are wrestling with the statement, as I've asked you before, is this your faith? I'm not asking if it's your family's faith, if this is your church's faith. Have you come to the cross? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed to God that you are a sinner in need of his forgiveness? Perhaps this morning is the day that you make this faith your faith, that you come into the family of God the Bible says that today is the day of salvation, that now is the time. With no one looking around, I want to give you that opportunity. If you recognize your need for Jesus Christ, if you recognize your need to take that step to make this your own faith, at this time, it takes a little bit of courage, but I promise I won't point you out or embarrass you. But would you just acknowledge before God, and even before myself, would you just put your hand up in the air and say, Pastor, pray for me. This this is where I'm at this morning. I need to take that step of faith. Consider that question. It is the most important decision that you will ever make, church. Who here would have the courage this morning? No one looking around. Pastor, would you just pray for me? I need to take this step. Thank you, sir. Who else this morning? Put their hand up. Pastor, just, would you pray for me? This is kind of where I'm at. Thank you, sir. Who else? Oh, church, this is so important. If God is knocking on your heart's door, if he's wrestling with you right now, this is no time to say no. With no one looking around, who would just raise their hand? Pastor, pray for me too. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Praise God. You can put your hand down. I'm going to ask one more time. We've had four or five hands go up at this point, but I don't want to leave anyone out. This is too important. If God is wrestling with your heart right now and you know that the next step of your faith journey needs to be a confrontation with that cross where you recognize your need for Jesus Christ because you cannot overcome your sin, 
who would acknowledge before God this morning, who has not already, I am in need of making this decision. Would you put your hand up before God? And Thank you, sir. Anyone else just acknowledging your need? Five or six hands this morning. To those who raised their hands, let me speak to you right now. God hears the prayer of the heart. You've heard this morning what the life of faith is. It is being completely surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's no longer living for yourself. It's living for him. You'll be given a new priority, a new purpose, a new direction in your life, new ownership. Everything will be made new. That's why you're called a new creation. If you will surrender your heart to the Lord. If you will confess your sin to God. And if you will place your faith and trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. If you are ready to make that commitment here this morning, would you pray, simply speak to God from your heart, a prayer like this. God, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I have sinned against you alone. And I'm sorry. I look at the cross where my sin debt was paid. And I see that the price was terribly high. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. God, I ask you to forgive me for the sin of my life. Wash me clean and make me pure. And in this moment, I place my faith and trust wholly in Jesus Christ alone. For him only, I will live and serve for the rest of the days of my life. Thank you, God, for saving me. With no one looking around, if you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, if you know that right now, based on God's word and God's promises, that you have entered into his family and began your spiritual journey, no one's looking around, I won't point you out, but I want to give glory to God. Who would raise their hand this morning? Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. Thank you, sir. Who else? Thank you, sir. Who else? Anyone else? So, Father, we just pause to pray right now. I thank you for these two who have now before you admitted and confessed their sinfulness and need for Jesus Christ and have cried out to him. And Father, I believe your word to be true and I believe these two men now are new creations just beginning their faith journey. Give them a boldness for Jesus Christ. May they not be bashful. May they not be embarrassed or ashamed in any way. Father, may they find a way to grow here and connect in their faith at Cornerstone. Father, for the other three or four who are still wrestling through this decision, Father, I pray that they would seek you thoroughly through this today. May, may they not put this off to another week. It's too important. Open their eyes to your love for them. Help them to understand the gospel. Overcome any excuses that the enemy would give to them to put this off any longer. It's simply too important. Their eternal destiny weighs in the balance. Father, I continue to pray for Cornerstone. As we see how you are working in this place, we see the need that we would continue on the journey that you have before us, that we would have facilities that would allow us to continue to grow. There's no sign that you're slowing down, Lord. Help us to accomplish all that you have before us, Father. Unite us in heart and mind as we sacrifice together to bring about the vision that you have given to us, this journey in faith. And Father, for those who may be on the fringes this morning, saved, yes, deeply connected, taking ownership in this story, no, not yet. But perhaps this morning has brought the clarity that will bring about that action step. Yes, Lord, put me to work here. Plug me in here. Help me to grow here. Help me to invest in others and build others up here. Let this be my church home. Father, I just pray that you would continue to build this church so that we can accomplish what you've called us to do. What an awesome God you are. 
We will follow you to the end, God, and we will rejoice and celebrate for all eternity for the great things that you have done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.